All right, awesome. Whoops. They will come back. Just like that. All right. So hi, everyone, and welcome to our Men and Masculinities panel hosted by the Title IX office here at SUNY Plattsburgh in part of our Sexual Assault Awareness Month initiative. Um, our theme for the month is the time is now to talk, to act, and to end sexual violence. So thank you for joining us and being a part of not only the talk, but the action of ending sexual violence in a discussion about masculinity and the way that it wraps around our world in our day-to-day -day life. Um, so my name is Aisha Nadler and I am the Violence Prevention Education and Outreach Coordinator here at SUNY Plattsburgh um, and I use she, her, and her pronouns. I will be one of the moderators today um, with one of our lovely interns who will now introduce themselves. Hi everybody, my name is Ciara Richmond. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. Uh, I am an intern with the LGBTQ plus resource committee. Uh, and thank you all to all of our panelists that will be joining us today. Um, they're going to take some time to introduce themselves so that you know exactly who they are and a little bit more about them. And anyone can jump there. I can go ahead first. Um, hi, how are, you doing? how are you doing everyone? My name is Charles Spence. I'm a current student, student here at SUNY Plattsburgh. I'm a history LS education major, BA MST. Um, I'm from the Bronx. Um, I'm also um, president of two organizations, Black Onyx BSU and Phi Beta Sim Fraternity Incorporated. Hey everybody, my name is Omar Stout. I'm the Title IX Deputy Coordinator at College. I use he, him pronouns. Uh, I also studied at Ithaca College. I studied corporate communication um, and uh, since took on that role as a Title IX Deputy. Um, in addition to my role at the school, uh, I also sit on the board at Family Children's Services of Ithaca, and I am the president of the Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated Alumni Chapter of Iota Iota Lambda. Um, and I'm very happy to be here with you all, and I look forward to this conversation. Should I pass it off? Uh, John, you're next on my screen. Thank you very much, Umar. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. I am John McMahon, um, he, him, his pronouns. Um, I'm originally from the suburbs of Denver, Colorado, um, so a bit of a travel to get to upstate New York. And uh, I teach classes in political science and law and justice here at SUNY Plattsburgh. And next on my screen is Sean. Hey, everyone. As you all may, may know, I'm Sean Rice, the coordinator of Multicultural Initiatives. I'm from Portland, Oregon. And I'm also a member of IOTA Phi Theta Fraternity Incorporated. And I'm here to Represent also from Portland, Oregon. Oh, and I'm going to pass it to Taekwon. Hello, my name is Taekwon. I am the president of Jedi and I'm the president of the cheerleading team here on campus. I also would like to say I do like to volunteer a lot in different organizations. That's pretty good. Um, I'm from Brooklyn and my pronouns is him, his. Ahan. Yeah, yeah, I was I was afraid it might be me. Um, hi, my name is Ahan. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his, and I'm originally from Sunnyside, Queens, uh, but now I'm up here at SUNY Plattsburgh, or well, not SUNY, but just Plattsburgh, and uh, I have been a peer support specialist for many years, but now I will be moving forward to be a mental health tech at CVPH. And... Um can't tell who's next. No, you're the last one. And it, okay. it's the best for last. Um, so thank you so much, everyone. And I hope you all are looking forward to all the insight they're going to give based on their backgrounds and their life stories. Um, but we're just going to start off the conversation um, by showing the trailer um, for a film called The Mask You Live that is touches on, again, a lot about um, the way boys grow up and the masculinity that they're facing, some of the common Theme that they're hearing and that's going to guide a little bit of our conversation today um, after the film we will ask them questions and then we'll head on there so i'm going to share my screen to show the video and just a thumbs up from anyone once you can hear the audio <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Stop crying. Stop with the tears. Don't cry. Pick yourself up. Stop with the emotions. Don't be a pussy. Don't let nobody disrespect you. Be cool and be kind of a dick. Always keep your mouth shut. Nobody likes a tattletale. Bros come before hoes. Don't let you women run your life. You bitch. What a fag. Get laid. Do something. Be a man. Be a man. Grow some balls. The three most destructive words that every man receives when he's a boy is when he's told to be a man. We've constructed an idea of masculinity in the United States that doesn't give young boys a way to feel secure in their masculinity. So we make them go prove it all the time. Within their peer group culture, each of them is posturing based on how the other boys are posturing. And what they end up missing is what they each really want, which is just that closeness. In good times, guys are like really close to each other. But when things get a little bit worse, you're on your own. From middle school, I had four really close friends. But once I kind of went into high school, I struggle finding people I can talk to because I feel like I'm not supposed to get help. Our kids get up every morning. They have to prepare their mask for how they're going to walk to school. A lot of our students don't know how to take the mask off. What is it you don't let people see? Almost 90% of you have pain and anger on the back of that paper. If you never cry, then you have all these feelings stuffed up inside of you, and then you can't get them out. They really buy into the, a culture that doesn't value what we've feminized. If we're in a culture that doesn't value caring, doesn't value relationships, doesn't value empathy, you are going to have boys and girls, men and women, go crazy. I had anger issues in high school. I felt like an outcast. I've been suspended at least once every year I was here. We would just look for trouble and just like try to fight. Boys are more likely to act out. They're more likely to become aggressive. Most people miss that as depression or see it as a conduct disorder or just a bad kid. I felt like just giving up on life. You know, I actually had suicide thoughts in my head at sixth grade. I felt alone for, for a long time. And I actually thought about killing myself. Whether it's homicidal violence or suicidal violence, People resort to such desperate behavior only when they are feeling shamed and humiliated or feel they would be if they didn't prove that they were real men. If you're told from day one, don't let nobody disrespect you, and this is the way you handle it as a man, respect is linked to violence. If I can man up, why well, step down from that, you feel me? It's like instinct. So man up. Man up. Man Act like a man. Be a man. Be a man. For my kids, I was going to end this hyper masculine narrative here. And let me stop it from playing on YouTube before it starts doing that. Um, so, again, as I mentioned, that is a part of a film called The Mask You Live In. Um, if you are at SUNY Plattsburgh and you have a CD player, I know those are still rare, um, but if you have a CD player, we do have the film if you ever want to watch it, um, feel free to email me. Uh, a bit of housekeeping items for, again, for those of you who are joining us, um, please know that you can use both the Q&A feature as well as the chat. Um, if you would like to ask any of our panelists questions as we go through, we will have some time at the end um, for some open mic questions or things that people want to share, um, but feel free to use the chat um, as well to engage with some of our panelists. Um, but we're going to get started um, in answering our question. And the first question today um, is for our panelists, specific ones, what do you recall as being your first experience or understanding of manhood? Um. Uh, so I, I was saying actually, just, uh, as you came in, uh, for me, that was, uh, it was TV, you know, I was a latchkey kid growing up. So it was, uh, uncle Phil, James Avery from the Fresh Prince. He was the first person I saw as a man. And I mean, thankfully enough, uh, in some instances, you know, I can see how certain things were problematic, but for the most part, I, I was pretty grateful that he was a pretty decent example. You know, for me, uh, I think the first time that uh, I was made to believe that the experiences that men and women um, using that binary were going to be inherently different 
was when I told my friends at school that my dad was a nurse. Um, and for context, my dad's a phlebotomist. I don't even think he even counts as a nurse. I love my dad. But, um, you know, from my child mind, he told me he was a nurse, so it makes sense. And when I went to school, my friend said, no, your dad's a doctor. Men cannot be nurses. And that made no sense to me because I'm like, you know, my dad wouldn't lie to me. Um, but it, it made me question a lot. And that's when I started looking at the world a little uh, th through, through different lenses. Um. I feel like on my end, it's more of a like experience. For me, it was more of having to like not grow up with a dad, but having to play the dad role for my little sister and brother. So I felt like having to like pay for trips and like actually help them with homework and fix them like meals and stuff like that. I took on that role as being a father figure. Um, I got one. So, um... I guess my first like interaction or realization of that was when my father called my sister pretty and I asked him and I said, dad, am I pretty too? He was like, no, men can't be pretty. Men only could be handsome. So that was definitely one experience I had. Thank you. So the next question that we have is what does masculinity mean to you? I'll go ahead again, I guess. Um, what masculinity means to me is just definitely being open and vulnerable. Um, I think it's not the worst thing in the world to be emotional. I'm a very emotional person. And I think that being in touch with your emotions is, is, is key parts in communication and relationships and friendships and everything like that. Um, I was one of those dudes who grew up without a father in the household. So I definitely had to learn a lot of things from scratch. So, and that's one of the biggest lessons that I learned over life in the course of my relationships was definitely just being open and vulnerable um, on how you're feeling and what's going on with you and that can keep the same. If I can just add, um, my personal opinion is that uh, the definition of masculinity, I mean, if, is arbitrary. Um, and I think it's kind of unfair to put any one definition on an individual. That's a lot of responsibility. Um, so if, if you ask what it means to me, right, that, that is the question. Uh, what it means to me is uh, to, 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 to be for my family. And I think that's the same thing it means to my sister. Uh, what, what does her femininity mean to, to support for her family? So I, I don't really have an answer to your question. So I wasted your time, I apologize. No, I think it was a great point, actually. And I think the reason we ask that is because there is a separation between masculinity and man, right? And I think sometimes people see them as together, um, which then leads into our next question as what does it mean to be a man to you? Because again, those are two different, two different ways of life in a way. Yeah, and no, I appreciate Zayesha you pointing that out. I mean, I think for me, being a man is like this constant feedback between the way I understand myself, the way I identify, right? So I was assigned male at birth, I'm cisgender, and my sense of myself is that I'm a man. So it's an interchange between like that and then also the social norms and the social forces and the social structures, you know, that are like shaping our experience um, for those on the, on the panel who are men as men, right? And so that's kind of one aspect for me, like it's that constant back and forth um, in relation to those social forces. And for me, like being a man is also something that's never, in isolation, right? Like my being a man is always being shaped by my whiteness or shaped by being bisexual or shaped by my privileged class structure um, and class position, right? Like I'm not subject to being murdered for having uh, an air freshener hanging in my car, right? Um, and that shapes who I am as a man and shapes what my experience of being a man is, right? So it's like the social forces that are shaping me and shaping how I'm a man are not just the fact that, that, um, that that's like a part of my identity. Thank you for that, John. Um, the next question is, what are some common misconceptions or misunderstandings of being a man and or masculinity. Can you repeat that, Apollo? What are some common misconceptions or misunderstandings of being a man and or masculinity? 
I'll start this out. Um, I think it just really comes with what society has built and what society has shaped for what a man is and just masculinity is in so many different pl like platforms. And a lot of times it's pushed as being aggressive, hard, no emotion, all of those different things. So it's the constant push from what society believes it to be rather than you having that internal conversation of what it is to you. Um, I think I could talk from, I guess, from being a college student, being from the city and then being from, from my own local area. I think what really the common misconception was that, that you had to have a lot of sexual conquest. You had to be on a sports team and your value and your worth was how you looked and how you dressed. Um, you were the alpha dog if you were able to achieve those things. And that is something that I had to deal with coming up and something that I, you know, that was my idea of what it being a man or being the top dog would be like. So I'm not getting made fun of and bullied so I could be accepted. So that's something that I definitely chased and I had to learn to kind of revert back into who I am as a person. The next question is, how are boys or men who don't fit the traditional definition of masculinity perceived? You know, I'd like to tie that into what Charles just said. I think it was powerful. Um, you know, I grew up in Brooklyn, Taekwondo, what's up? Uh, and there's uh, a lot of uh, pressure to fit into a specific mold. Um, and I'm sure that's the same wherever you grow up. Um, but it became dangerous when you didn't uh, present in that mold. And when you're not on a sports team, you're not the dude getting all the women uh, and you can't, you can't check off the boxes that they said you had to check then you might get beat up. You might get jumped. You might get robbed. And, you know, it's a sad story, but uh, it pushed a lot of us, that peer pressure pushed a lot of us into, into finding that thing that we could fit into. And so I think, it, it, you know, it, it's scary to not fit in. Um, and then it's, uh, it's, a, it's alarming um, what, what, what people might do, what, what you might do to try to fly under the radar. Yeah, just to add to that, it's also the point of getting that mark as other. If you don't fit into their box, what else are you? Oh, you're weak. Oh, you're less than. Oh, you're, you're not a man. You don't fit the mold. So you don't get that title because of these different notches that you don't take off. So it's always a negative connotation behind not fitting the mold when it comes to masculinity or being a man. Yeah, um, I agree. Like, it's just, if you don't fit the, like you said before, the box of like, if you don't get the check mark for the box, then you're clearly not a man. And it's like, for example, if you don't play basketball, or if you don't dress a certain way, wear a certain type of shoes, or like, it's just like, you don't fit in. If, let's say, for example, for a gay male growing up just in a third, he wouldn't hang around with guys. He would hang around with girls, because that's what we're comfortable with, because they treat him with respect. So it's just like, if you don't fit that certain criteria, it's just not going to work out for you. And I think that's a, a great point. And even to, you know, a lot of you, like you said, you grew up like that, right? That was that mindset of how you were growing up and how you were raised and things like that. But I guess it's also, we're seeing things differently and come out in the media just a bit, every now and again, it switches. Sometimes it's not good, um, but every now and again, we'll see something. So, you know, are things actually changing? Are there some ways that the traditional norms of masculinity are changing? or is it just a facade? Um, I think that there's actually definitely motivation for change and there's definitely some steps being taken, but there's also a lot of pushback. Um, I think the status quo has remained in for so long and so many people have become so comfortable in what that brings that that pushback is twice as violent and twice as aggressive. So I think it's all that much more important to fight it with education, you know, and, and, and you know, informing, uh, you know, men that things don't have to be this way. You know, it, it is, it's limiting. 
I, I, I think it's similar to uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. I think, you know, it's always been here. It's always been present. People are just paying attention to it now. You know, uh, I think there's always been men who love to cook, but now it's more than just Gordon Ramsay, right? Uh, and so uh, I, I'd like to be an, op uh, an optimist and say that uh, we're, we're, we're proud to be who we are, no matter where we fall in the spectrum of masculinity. Um, I would think that personally, depends on which group you're discussing. I find that as like, you know, me trying to become an educator and my pursuit for education, I feel like it may be different for younger kids. And it is as you get to college, people, you know, grow out of certain tendencies and habits and stuff like that. So I think it would honestly depend on where you're at in your life and what you're surrounded with. And then, you know, because that's college, you, I've, I've noticed personally that everything becomes a little bit more progressive. I've learned a lot because of college about myself, about um, interactions with consent women and all that stuff that you learn and it really and I feel like on this side it gets better but I don't know if like it is when you're younger or you're in high school and you're in middle school and people are not really privy to that knowledge um I also think it goes back to like actually celebrating the change and the challenge of the previous norms because a lot of times like um Ahan was saying like there's that pushback that amplified voice of this is negative this is wrong you shouldn't do this because this is what we've been told forever so those challenges need to be more more so celebrated and uplift and amplify as well as much as the negative that comes with it And I think that's a great point. So thank you for that, Sean, because I think as we try to get people on board with this progressive movement and shining a light on things, we also need to understand why are you pushing us back? I think there is one sense of, you know, or holding us back more so. I think there is one where it's like, this is what we're used to, right? This is the status quo, this is what we stick to. Uh, but I, I feel like sometimes there's something more. Um, so do you, any of you have an idea as to why some men resist the change or, you know, cling on to those traditional gender roles? Yeah, I mean, first, I just kind of want to second what everyone else just said in response to the other question. I mean, and that sets up like precisely this dynamic, Zaysia, where, you know, like there is individual and there is collective power in inhabiting a gender role that is associated with dominating others or accumulating resources of all kinds at the expense of other people, right? Um, especially when like there are multiple parts of myself that benefit in that way. Um, so I think there's like this actual kind of way in which people develop this, whether conscious or unconscious, like stake or investment um, in a position of dominance that makes it that much harder, I think, to like, to, or makes it much easier to resist changing that. And it's also that, you know, we, or many of us as men, like never or rarely are forced to or compelled to think about ourselves as men or think about ourselves as gender as a part of power relations um, with regards to other genders, right? Like we have the option that women and non-binary people do not have or do not always have, right? To like ignorantly or unthinkingly live our gender. Right, we have that option in many circumstances, not all circumstances, and it's shaped by other forces as well. Right, but like that is something that is available to us as men that is not available to others. Um, I think also adding to the conversation that a lot of times people. I don't know if they don't have the separation or they always pair gender with sexuality, so a lot of times they feel that if oh if you have any little sample of femininity, oh, you automatically have a different title you have. You're definitely on the spectrum of being a part of the LGBTQIA plus community. So a lot of times people don't want that mark or don't want that um, title. So that's why they kind of cling on to the old traditions and the old concepts because they don't want to say that, oh, just this person expressing themselves is who they are, not so much who they lay with. like that um and now a little bit more personal but is there any of the traditional roles that you all have difficulty leaving behind right because I think sometimes we you know as panelists we're like oh you know I'm, I'm good I'm progressive but I think we all have those you know those small things where it's just like 
but I really like that, or that wasn't that bad. So is there anything that you kind of have a little bit difficulty leaving behind? Well, um, I'm definitely, I would say I'm like on the path of kind of working on it, but like, you know, in the very beginning of my relationship with my, my now spouse, you know, she was always the main breadwinner, you know, she, she did the, the thing, went to school, then all that. I did more of the mess up and do a bunch of other stuff. And, uh, you know, I'm working on all that now, but I think leaving behind that whole idea that I had to be the provider or catch up to her or do this or do that, you know, to, to kind of give my, my worth value, you know, I had to leave that behind. And, and, and you know, now, like I said, it, it was limiting. It, it was very limiting. And, and now I feel a whole lot more freer when I'm just pursuing things for the right reasons, you know, just for betterment so that everything else can get better around. So that's about it. I, I, I feel like we need to do a study or something because I'm feeling the exact same way you are at this point in time. I think, uh, you know, as a, as a young male, um, it, it has really hindered my ability to connect with people in that way um, because I feel like I need to be the Superman sometimes. And, you know, I am trying to unlearn that. Um, and, you know, it's never, it's never going to be just a, a one day I'm done. It's always going to be uh, an ongoing process. Um, but in addition to being the breadwinner, being the person who doesn't have, you know, emotions, right, who, who can hold your burden and my own um, and learning that I don't have to do that I mean, inviting somebody else in, that's, that's a hard thing for me to do. Um, and I'm looking forward to a time when I, when I can do that. Omar, I appreciate the way you said it framed as kind of like this constant work that we're all doing. And I think like one thing that's hard for me and it continues to be hard, right, is forming um, like deeper emotional friendships with other men, right? Like I came, you know, got to a point in college or like right out of college where I realized that like all of my more emotionally resonant relationships were with women or non-binary people and not with men, right? So like, that's a thing that I've had to unlearn and practice even as like in my head, I can say why that's happening and why that's not good and not healthy. Um, but like, that's a constant kind of undoing in my actual life and in my actual relationships with people. So what does the term toxic masculinity mean to all of you? Um, the first thing that jumps out at me is expressing your masculinity in aggressive way that oppresses those around you. Um, always in competition with another person. Um, it's always, I got to get above you. Um, no matter in, in any any way or facet. Um, mine would definitely be telling someone who they are without them introducing themselves or giving you permission to have that authority. <laughs> telling them, oh, you're not a man because of this. Blank. Any of that toxic masculinity. So how does media and pop culture reinforce traditional gender norms? Um, I definitely think about the music we hear. Um, I think it's, it's sex, sex, money, money, drugs, drugs, kill, money, 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 sex, sex. And um, that's all that we're kind of like, to think and I think especially with like nowadays like this has had to do with like man and relationships like because we see too much options or we're taught that the biggest body or the the most fly or stuff like that is stuff that you have to achieve and then then social media gives us these unex unrealistic goals that we like I can't go out and be a rapper and then have 30 women across my arm like I can't do that and that's what everyone achieves and then it, and it, and it, it, it hurts their lifestyle and their expectations so they feel underachieving if they're not getting somewhere closer to that. So, yeah. I think that's also a really like, oh, go ahead. 
Wow. Oh, nah, I, I was just gonna say that uh, I think when Charles dropped that 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 line right there, somebody somewhere said bars, <laughs> and I think it, it it speaks to capitalism, and I think there's a a they, there's a tax on, on on masculinity and femininity, and um, I think we 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 perpetuated in this cycle. Uh, and I'm not, and to be honest, I'm not sure. I'm not I'm not a social psychologist, right? I'm not sure how it's done or 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 where the 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 benefit is. Um, I do know that it's reinforced because the money lies within us uh, following these traditional um, standards, and you see it everywhere. Just like Charles said, in music, you see it on TV, you see it in the food you buy. I can actually tell you a funny story about food, but another time. I feel like that's a setup to tell us a story now, but it's okay. We'll give you some time. Um, but what I was gonna say is it's a great, it's very timely that we're having this conversation too, because I don't know how many of you watch SNL, um, but Kid Cudi was actually a musical guest on SNL the other day. Um, and in a dedication to Kurt Cobain wore a dress and the internet has been in like flames. And it's funny cause you'll just look and you're like, there's been several prominent men who's worn dresses, long heels and all of these things. And even the history of heels um, and how it started with men um, at that time and kings and all those things. So it's very interesting how timely we're still seeing masculinity and toxic masculinity play a role um, in our society. Um, but we've heard, you know, at the same time, there's been some prominent figures. And again, myself, I work in the Title IX office and I often hear concerns from men, young men, boys, um, as it relates to consent, their safety, um, so on and so forth. And even prominent figures, especially at the height of the Me Too movement, um, were making statements such as, it's a scary time to be for young men right now. How would you respond to a comment like that? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Yep. Um, prominent figures have said it's a scary time for young men right now. How would you respond to a comment like that? Um, personally, um, with that comment, I would have to agree because I feel like now it's bringing out the truth of what men, certain men do is wrong. And it's like, they'll see it as it's not wrong because it's, it makes them the man as it says to be, but it really doesn't. It's the truth is now coming out of what your actions that you say are okay, which are not. Yeah, Taekwon, I think that's a really excellent point because I mean, like, if it's uh, scary for young men, I don't think it's scary for young men in the way this particular prominent figure meant it and not for the people he meant it about. Um, you know, because if, if it's scary, like what Taekwon was saying, it's that, um, you know, if there's a loss or a partial loss or like a challenge to um, like the unquestioned dominance or oppression or license to engage in violence, um, if that's taken away or being shipped away at, right, like maybe that's scary. But if that's the case, then like that, you know, as Taekwondo was saying, like shows these deeper issues and shows what there is to work on, you know, which also means it's like, a challenge where if gender roles and gender norms and gender structures are shifting, right, then like that also means it's a challenge for men to be part of affecting that shift. And like, ultimately, it's a better, it's better for men, it's better for masculinity, like, if we actively contribute to that project of shifting things, right, if we live more egalitarian lives, if we like, want to live a more liberated life and a more liberated society, right, like, that is actually good, even if some interpret it as scary. Yeah, this this is just a, a hard one because so many people say those statements, definitely the older crowd. So I would kind of flip it on them. I'm like, it's a scary time to be an old traditional person that is stuck in their ways. How about that? Um, I think it's I think it is kind of hard because everything is so confusing because there's not this one directed path for certain individuals. I feel like we have once again, because we're also overloaded with different options, different things, different paths to take, it's like hard finding ourselves because there's so many things um, out there to kind of grab and taste and experience. And we're kind of, I feel like sometimes as a person, I feel pressured into doing certain things. Just overall, 
um, as a young person to I have to be this, I have to be that, and I have to be labeled, you know what I'm saying? So it's very just confusing overall to kind of navigate through, through, through life choices and stuff like that because of it. Yeah, and I, I think the additional burden comes from trying to break that, right? And trying to, to, to just be a, a person. That, and the joke I was gonna talk, talk about earlier is just, you know, I remember being in the, the intimate section of Walmart, right? Where they have all the sexual protective products up in the thing. And I was just talking about it with my friend. We were just making jokes about the different varieties. And then I went home. And if you look at the ad, you know, the iPhone, but listen to you, you look at the ads and what they're trying to sell to you, right? And it really is sex and different ways to get sex, right? All my ads on Instagram were sexual health and uh, do I want a six pack abs? And it's just it's just interesting to me the way the media and, and pop culture will push a, a, a rhetoric and a norm down your throat. I think both of those are great segues and to know that someone's always watching us. <laughs> those ads will always follow you no matter where you go even if you delete your cookies they watch it um but that's beside the point uh so as i mentioned these comments came at the height of the me too movement and again it's sexual assault awareness month um and we know that yes men do experience um sexual violence and it's least likely to be reported um so for you how do men fit into the me too movement um, in addressing sexual assault, in changing the culture around sexual assault? How do they exist and what can they do to make a difference? Um, so I'll start off, nobody minds. Um, thank you for highlighting that Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Um, you know, uh, in part of my role at the college, um, we do a lot of trainings uh, and the training uh, lens that we look at is, is prevention, right? Um, and just general awareness and education. Um, and we do that through the, the bystander model, reminding people that sexual violence is, is not anyone's particular problem. It doesn't exist in a bubble or a microcosm. It is a public health issue. It is pervasive and committed against anybody. It is violent and harmful to everybody um, that exists within that area. Um, so speaking specifically about men, uh, I would ask anyone, right? Just think about what happens in your private areas, right? In your private conversations, in your spheres of influence. What are people saying? What jokes are they making, right? What's normalized? When people are talking about uh, pursuing uh, a partner, are they doing so in a lens that would lend itself to rape culture? And if they are, how are you responding to that? Are you challenging that? Right? Are you calling them in for a conversation and asking them to redirect that narrative? And if you're not, I encourage you to come to a training. I'm sure Zayaja has them over there. You want to come over to Ithaca College, we've got some over here. And, 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 and think about the ways that you can make the world better because that small, that small uh, action you take can, can have a, a monumental impact. Thank you for that. And yeah, just to plug, we actually do have a bystander intervention workshop next week. Plug that in there. Um, so check the calendar. <laughs> it's on the calendar. Um, thank you. Does anyone else want to tackle that? We're still sticking with the violence theme here. Wait, quick question. Um, repeat yep. it one more time. I got you. So time. how do I'm men sure. how do men fit into the Me Too movement? Um, I think being allies. Um, sometimes I feel like men should should stay in their own lane, um, when, when, especially when women are doing things. I think certain things we can't understand because women are women and we are men, um, not to put anybody in one specific category. But I think just being allies, being supportive, listening to what they're saying um, and having those same conversations with your peers, like like sort of similar to what Omar was saying, like, you know, when you're having conversations with people, you know, like if someone if, if someone says, yo, like, I have a friend and they always come at that specific friend and they, they say, oh, that person you're hanging out with is blah, 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 blah. I don't want to use any expletives right now. I would be like, yo, bro, don't do that. That's, you know, that's not respectful. But just at the same time, once again, just being, being supportive, listening to what they have to say because they're not saying it for no reason. The Me Too movement doesn't exist for no reason. Um, 
so yeah, just being an ally, being listening and, and, and being receptive and having those same conversations amongst your groups. Yeah, I would also say just showing up. Sometimes definitely with anything related to um, sexual assault or violence, it's always the point of men not reporting, men not being able to be vulnerable. And I would definitely say supporting your friends, supporting different people that come to you about this, being able to really step up and show up in different spaces, showing up to the marches, showing up to conversations, showing up for your, your peers and for yourself, like in representing whatever you stand for in the situation and not so much being passive of it. I think in some ways you just answered the next one, but I'm still gonna ask in case anyone has anything else to add. Uh, but the next question is, how does violence intersect um, with masculinity? So how do they kind of collide in the same way? Right, so I mean, I teach classes in political science, right? So I think about this as a political question, right? Like this is a country that was founded through linking together uh, a certain notion of masculinity, a certain notion of white supremacy and settler colonialism and violence that wraps all of those things together, right? So like, I think about this on this kind of like broad political and historical level, right? That it's functioning that way and so then when it, when it appears in interpersonal context, when it appears in sexual relationships or sexual violence between two people, right, as an expression of a certain kind of violent masculinity, that's, I think, like always also playing out this kind of like grand historical project that we have to, you know, not only be bystanders as Omar and Zaysia and Sean were saying, um, you know, in the moment of one of our friends says something bad or is about to do something bad and we intervene there, like we also have to like bystander intervene in these political processes that we're a part of and that are shaping us. And that I think are kind of like underlying or underlining the kinds of like very real interpersonal violences that happen through masculinity. Thank you for that. Um, and then just to take it a little bit more into intersectionality, but if you don't know, intersectionality is a term coined by Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw back in the 60s to explain how all the identities that one individual has um, come together. So we're not just individual beings that can just navigate our life as, oh, I'm just black. No, you're black man, black woman, black non-binary individual all of those are going to change your life perspective um, and the way that you respond and walk through life. Um, so the next thing, and now talking a little bit more about LGBTQ issues, right? Because men, we know, unfortunately, there are a lot of Black trans women who are killed often by men um, in rapid numbers. Um, so in talking now about homophobia and transphobia, where do those intersections lie and how do we protect um, and get other men to protect and support um, our LGBTQ community members as well? Um, well, I think they interact and intersect heavily in the sense of toxic masculinity where like we were talking about earlier, how, you know, we have these ideas that you know, masculinity is supposed to represent and when there's something that diverges from that social norm, you know, men are kind of like linking to the violence thing earlier. They're kind of linked automatically to just jump to that, you know, to prove their manliness. Like, oh, like it's, uh, you know, someone is being LGBTQ around me. I have to prove that I'm manly or else other people will think I am too. And, you know, it's, it's, it's really sad. And what needs to be done is, you know, it, it's kind of like that whole education thing and calling people out, and, you know, having people, you know, accept this, like, and not just accept it, but like, you know, go beyond that, you know, show love because at the end of the day, you know, humans, we're all humans and we got to look out for each other. It's, it's just, it's, it's frustrating. Yeah, I mean, to kind of build on what Ihan said, I mean, you know, it's not surprising um, that so much 
anti-queer, anti-trans violence um, is carried out through masculinity by feminizing queer and trans people, right? Which says something both about how toxic masculinity views queer and trans people and how toxic masculinity views women more broadly, right? If it's by feminizing queer and trans people that they become subject to masculinized violence. Um, you know, and I think that like one of the things and this I think is speaks to what I was just saying is that like, you know, when we think about LGBTQ plus people, when we think about trans people, right, that shows that there actually is in fact nothing essential and unchanging and timeless about masculinity itself, right? So like all those dynamics that folks have like so wonderfully spoken to already, like the negative associations of masculinity, like get shown that it doesn't have to be that way. Right, but then that ends up like causing backlash, or people feel challenged, or people feel scared, or whatever the case may be, right? And so, like, I think that both of those things are some of what we see when we see um, anti-trans, anti-queer violence. Thank you. Well, the next question that we have here is: How has masculinity in your life? changed from early childhood to today? Um, for me, uh, it was a lot of what um, Charles was saying earlier about, uh, you know, just having that idea that you had to be this, you had to have this uh, to be the man, the top dog. And, you know, now it's, it's definitely different. I think it's starting to change to become this kind of like um, it's leaning towards having this authenticity, being open. Um, and, and, you know, I never would have even dreamed of coming out as pansexual when I was younger. And now it's like, well, now that's what it means to be a man, to be your true authentic self. And I think, you know, that's very important. I, I think that's essential to not just not just men everywhere, but like, you know, uh, women, wherever you feel, uh, you know, on the spectrum anywhere, you know, it's just that authenticity. I think that's, that's been a huge change. Um, for me, I think it's kind of going off what Ahan said. It's just like kind of going away from what was traditional and what was already set out for me and kind of doing that self authorship, giving myself the opportunity to define what masculinity is to me, what is a man to me, rather than focusing so much of the outer and focus more so internally and how it impacts my life and how a lot of I, 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 <laughs> rather than they or them. <laughs> Um, can you read the question again? I'm sorry. You good? Uh, what, whoa. How has masculinity in your life changed from early childhood to today? Um, I feel like growing up, like it was said before, it's the traditional things that you have to go by. Like, for example, when it comes to dancing, I was a dancer growing up. So it's like, I couldn't do certain moves because then I'll be seen as a ballet dancer and like those that's what girls do well that's what girls do and now it's like now more men are dancing freely and able to do all these different things and express themselves in any form of way that they want so I can see a change in expression in the masculine culture all right um so I we have one more question that we have outlines but we did have one come through the Q&A. Um, so again, if you have anyone that's an attendee, um, feel free to raise your hand, add your questions to the Q&A. Um, but I'm gonna last, ask the last one that we have set up and then we're gonna shift to the Q&A and the chat. So again, feel free if you are here as an attendee um, to utilize the chat or the Q&A feature to answer, ask any questions that you may, you may have. Um, but our last question from the office is, what advice would you give to boys and men growing up in today's society? Um, I would tell them, you know, this is something I want to I want to do. I, I'm, I'm all about big brother mentorship and stuff like that. I would just tell them, um, live your life, um, make choices. Don't be afraid to fall down. Don't be afraid to talk. Don't be afraid to to come into a vulnerable space because that's one thing that I've, I've seen one of my teachers. So a, a little story. So one of my teachers, he has something called real talk 
and where he gets, and I went to all boys school called Eagle Academy. So he will come and get all the boys to just talk and vent. And you will see how over the course of the weeks we talking and we getting from just regular stuff about video games into our fathers not being in our lives and breaking down in tears. So don't be afraid to reach out and ask for help and and, and, and really look up to people and, and, and achieve for greatness because at the end of the day, that's what our jobs are to the younger cats um, coming up right now. Um, I'll go next. Um, I would definitely say there's power and vulnerability. I would say just to express yourself and to be free and be yourself, that is just so impactful. You never know whose life you're going to impact by just being you and that your path is just that, your path. And, and I, you know, I think the theme here is be yourself. Um, I, I'll tell you what I told my little brother when he was in high school uh, and having troubles. There is not one mold, one model, one milestone that you have to accomplish. You are an individual um, and you are unique and that's okay, right? And be who you want to be um, and fail where you fail and rise where you rise, no matter what the sun's going to shine. I feel like we all came to a good understanding that you have to just be yourself and just don't let nobody tell you that you can't be happy in life. Um, yeah, and building on that, uh, I would say first and foremost, above anything, integrity, 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 especially when no one's looking, when no one else is around, call out people because that's when that's how things are going to change by people finding these things out, being told these things, you know, I mean, it's, it, it's a hard thing to do, but that kind of courage, it can lead people to a very, very wonderful place. All right. So I'm going to, and again, attendees, feel free to add your question. Um, I'm just going to put in the chat the question that was asked. Um, so the question was, what have been some of your protective factors to maintain your confidence? And I think we hear a lot about that in terms of all of you talking about authentic selves, um, but your confidence and mental health while also dealing with societal pressures and inability to meet unrealistic expectations. Um, uh, I'll say two things have been a, a very a big help for me, uh, social media, right? It's, it's a rabbit hole, but, you know, being able to see, uh, different, uh, representations of what it means to be black a man, um, you know, a young man, whatever may have you that that's all been great. Uh, but I'm also very privileged to have a very strong group of black friends, um, men, women, and non-binary. Uh, who are I'm able to lean on in those conversations and, and have those real talk, uh, as Charles has said, those moments um, in adulthood. Um, I think I'm figuring it out, and I think we all are, and and that that uh that makes things a little a little smoother. Yeah, I want to echo what Omar said about like having those friendships, those relationships where. Like these are part of your regular conversations, right? So if someone needs to call you in or call you out, like that's a place where like those relationships are places where that can happen. Um, and that's been really important for me. Then the other part that's been really important to me is like, is therapy, right? And like having my mental health, like working on it, right? That's, that's the definition of like always working on it and never like arrived, um, you know, but that's been in like an essential part of how I like have changed how I understand myself and my masculinity is through therapy and through like that kind of work on myself. Yeah, I'll just pretty much echo what everyone was saying. It's just finding the, your family, finding your chosen family, find those people you can truly be vulnerable with and those people that can let you know, hold it to mirror, like, hold on, this is you. What's, what's going on with this? Like for real, that can hold up that mirror, but also with the expectations, throw those out the window. You need to set your own goals for yourself and have your own plan because it's all about you. It's not about what the society is saying 
this is what you need to be. This is what you need to do. This is the structure you need to take. Focus on what you do and focus on your plan. And sometimes counseling, that definitely can help with creating that plan, creating those different blueprints for how you want your life to be. Um, also, just like being to yourself and understand more about you as a person also helps. Uh, I feel like at the end of the day, you shouldn't really care about what other people think because the more you care, the more it's going to set, set, set you back and you're not going to be happy. So just don't care what people have to say and just live life to the fullest. I think uh, one thing that helps me a lot is expressing yourself and just ex finding a way to do it. it no matter how it is writing journaling poems music anything dance that that's it's been a big help i just want to highlight that earlier sean said self-authorship i don't know if that's a commonly used term but I love that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start using that every day. And I think that's one. one way that you can definitely, uh, 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 you know, age in mental health, right? Just being the author of your own story um, and be the hero of your own story. I learned about that in theory. So you can look at that. Oh, oh. <laughs> We got another question. Um, how old were you when you realized that um, boys and girls were um, placed in boxes? And do you have a story? I know some of you talked a little bit about, you know, your first experience with it. But anything, any storytelling do you guys, you all want to do? I got a story. So uh, one time uh, I... So I grew up in Queens. I went to school at PS 150 and we had a nice big old schoolyard and it was, you know, there's a lot of janky and weird shit around there. You know, you'd find broken bottles and all that, but you know, that's, that's Queens. But so one time I, I was just standing, I, I guess in the corner and one of my neighbors, this, um, she was older. I, I may have had a little crush on her, but it, you know, never really went anywhere. But uh, I just remember she was being bothered by this guy. I was in the fourth grade and he was in the sixth and he was like really tall and um, he was bothering her. And one of my friends was like, hey, you know, uh, you should go like help her out. You know, I mean, she's your friend, isn't she? And I'm like, yeah, OK, but what am I going to do? You know, this guy's like two feet taller than I am. He goes, well, you know, if you impress her, she might like go out on a date with you. And I was just like, what's, why can't I just help her? Cause she's my neighbor. <laughs> and like, so, you know, I just realized at that point, like my friend was just seeing this as like an opportunity as opposed to just doing the right thing, which I was just like, I, I don't care about any of that. And I just remember, I don't even know what came over me, but I actually rushed the dude. And I held him up in the fans and I said, some, some really corny, like beat it, Jack, or something like that. <laughs> and the guy's like, he's look, he's of course looking at me because I'm like two feet shorter than this guy. And he's looking at the girl. He's like, do you know this guy? He's like, yeah, fine, kid, whatever. <laughs> just, <laughs> he walks away. I just remember that was just such a ridiculous, ridiculous thing. I remember just feeling just really silly over the whole situation because I was like, I'm pretty sure she could have handled herself. <laughs> and, you know, it, it was just, it was weird. That was the first time I noticed that, you know, men and women are placed in boxes. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, go ahead. Okay, um, I have a story. I feel like I realized it in the sixth grade when Okay, so I, okay, so growing up, I lived in like, you know, the projects, you know, the area. So then it's like the basketball court, you have the guys that play basketball. And then in the park area, you have the girls that play double dutch. So I would be the type of kid to go over there and try to learn more of the double dutch. Cause you know, that was fun. It was rope, you know, all cool and thing. But then I remember having my cousin come up to me saying how my uncle wanted to talk to me, saying how, you know, you can't play double dutch cause you're a boy. So it was like, ever since then, I realized that, okay, there's a certain way and you can even see that, okay, boys are on this side and girl, girls are on this side. So it was always just like, that box was just always there growing up. 
I, I like telling stories. Um, uh, similar, I also had my experience in sixth grade. Uh, I went to a performing arts, I went to New Voices uh, Middle School and you had to choose uh, between dance, music, uh, theater or computer science. Uh, and so it felt as if all the, the women, like they just did what they want to do. Like they want to dance, they want to do music. It felt that way. Um, my best friend at the time wants to dance and I want to do theater. I didn't realize that there were like connotations on that, but we started, like people started trying to make fun of us. Uh, and then we, like, it was, it was, like I said, I had that privilege of having that support network because we look at each other, but he with all the girls or I'm with all the girls. And, and, and that's how we rationalize it to ourselves. Uh, just as this arbitrary thing, like what, what makes your, your masculinity, right? Am I too feminine or am I not feminine enough? Uh, but it, it was an eye-opening weekend for us. There seemed to be a lot going on in sixth grade and maybe that's where we need to, we need to start that sixth grade. <laughs> Um, hold on one second. Sierra, can you see it? The question? Yeah, the next one. Yeah. All right, you want to do that one? Okay. So the next question is, do you think that children, movies, film has influenced the way you see masculinity growing up? Uh, quick question. Did, is it saying that did what we watch, did it shape our masculinity or um, that's the question? Yeah. But, um, I'm kind of indifferent about this. I watched a lot of anime and cartoons and I wasn't really watching a lot of like show shows. So like, if you want me to be very honest with you, you could take my, you know, my black card. Most people say my black card. If I never watched Martin, I never watched Martin. I never watched Moesha, none of those shows. <laughs> I'm off the call <laughs> now. Fresh you got time, man, you got time. <laughs> Just a little bit. So um, I think that, I think when I was younger, I didn't really catch it. So yeah, I guess, I don't know. I'm just wasting on time, my fault. <laughs> Well, I, I think there's there's space for that, like uh, in the cartoon anime realm, because I mean, I, I definitely watched some stuff like, I don't know if anybody remembers the 90s Spider-Man cartoon that was really popular. You know, that that taught me a lot for me. For some reason, in my it got in my head that being a, a you know, a grown man meant suffering a butt ton for very little return. <laughs> and you know and, and you know you just do things because it's the right thing to do you swallow it and you just do it the next day and that's that's pretty much what it was like that's what I learned from that but it took a lot to still work on on learning that stuff you know I mean you still deal with that you have that guilt like I didn't do this I I didn't do enough All I got to say is Charles, Netflix was really holding it down for you for Black History Month. So I hope you got a few episodes in because they was, they was out there. They was I only there. watched like the reruns or a couple episodes when I'm in a barbershop or, you know, I never really sat and really like watched it season by season. We'll, we'll allow it for today. <laughs> we'll allow it. Um, we have someone that just wants to unmute to ask their own question. So let's see if this works. Oh, it worked. There we go. Yeah, I just wanted to add on to this question. Like, I don't know who, like, if anyone, like, watched, like, Degrassi. Like, I know there's some things that I grew up on, like, Degrassi, like, Nets to Classified, and, like, just, like, seeing um, masculinity and, like, actual shows that we could have kind of related to or even looked up to. Um, but, yeah, that's all I had, so. You just took me back with the grassy. Uh, me and my sister used to watch that show religiously. I pretended like I didn't like it because one of those, you know, masculinity things. But I love that. Yo, I love that show. All right. And when Drake got yo, anyway, you don't got to. <laughs> but I, I think I think well, I think like Charles said, looking back on it, right? Like there's a lot of ways that it's influenced me, right? And even the relationship I have with my sister. And that I still feel, my sister's older than me by a lot, but I feel like I'm her protector, 
right? If she has a, a, bro, a boyfriend, they got to come through me, all right? Like, and for, I mean, I don't, it's not right. And I'm trying to unlearn that behavior, but I definitely think it's influenced the way I, I envision the world and the way I build relationships because uh, I think we're talking about anime. I've been taught to be the hero. I've been taught that the hero is the happy person, right? And after you struggle and suffer and get beat up and beat down, when you get back up that last time, that's when everything's going to be good for you. I, I feel like I somewhat saw the opposite because like, like you, I didn't want to say I was watching it, but Sailor Moon was the stuff back then. Like seeing them, but it, <laughs> like, that was the stuff. So just seeing seeing women empowered and just like strong being able to defend themselves. I just hate the fact that it was so such a big thing when this dude came and just threw a rose, like he was the savior. I'm like, y'all got all the power. He don't even have no powers. Like, what is happening? So I would definitely say, like, just being able to see the the shifts and the opportunities for women and men and just people that don't identify with either of those. It just gives them opportunities to express themselves and express different emotions, show that we can be different things in different settings as well. No, nah, I really agree because there's definitely like, I love what you said about um, um what both you, uh, Sean and Omar said about those two shows. I felt like I would never tell, like, I'll be honest, like I was watching Bad Girls Club with my sister. I was never, I'm not jacking that. So <laughs> I'm not. Um, So it's like, yeah, also, I guess in that regard, like we're, we like a lot of things and we're told because we're men or we're boys that we can't watch that, we can't enjoy that. And we never have a conversation about our peers. So we feel once again, limited to like the Dragon Ball Z's or the, you know, Johnny Test type of shows. Um, I think it's really interesting that someone brought up Degrassi because I think when I was younger, you know, when we had that whole, you know, the, the, the mascu toxic masculinity thrust upon us about, you know, if, your friend's gay, you got to cut ties with them, you know what I mean? And stuff like that. It was so messed up. And I just remember watching the grassy and there was this whole storyline with Marco, one of the characters and his friend Spinner. And it, it just touched my heart. I cried for like, like that whole night. Cause I was just thinking like, how can someone abandon their friend? Like, you know, say, like someone who you've like touched hearts with. And, and like, I just remember that. I'm like, well, that doesn't make a difference. And it's a lot of the reasons why, you know, some friends, I guess, later on felt more comfortable to come out to me and stuff like that moving on. And I, I just think like there are some of those positives out there, like like the grassy and we'll have those moments and stuff like that. And I definitely got to throw it out there because so many people are so quick to say like, oh, um, homosexuality is being forced on us. It's forced on the children. I'm like, well, stop having TV raise your children. <laughs> That's what I would definitely say. I would definitely say if you're not prepared to have conversations about these things with your children, don't have children. Because <laughs> at any time this can happen, societies can teach um, children about different forms of um, expression, different forms of identity and sexual orientation so just being open to understand that representation is key because that gives them a view of different options that they can take and different full views and holistic ideas of what's going on in the real world I, so I, I don't know if there are any more questions Zayasia, but I'm surprised that no questions came in about challenging or, or having this conversation at the dinner table Right, I, I'm from a Caribbean household. My family is from Guyana, South America. And um, I don't know what people's introductions or experience with Caribbean culture is, but it, it does not look favorably, uh, favorably on non-masculine men. Um, and the, the, in some places the Caribbean, it, it, it raises to homicide. Um, so, you know, a lot of my, I recognize now as an adult that a lot of my father's uh, uh, upbringing of me was to, to protect me from what he thought was a very real danger. But I'm really curious now, like how, how were my fellow panelists engaged in those conversations if you are and if you feel comfortable um, at home? I don't, um, I ain't gonna lie. Um, both my parents are from Jamaica. Uh, my family, my entire family is Jamaican. So we don't even have conversations about that. 
much less said at the dinner table and talk. I mean, everybody is kind of different. Everybody's family is a little different. So, but I think in my, my experiences, I never get a, got a chance to talk about that. And that's why for a very long time, I was withholding a lot of my feelings and it became very negative, I would say. Um, so then you just got to find outlets, find your friends, find therapists, find people who can really like do get a better understanding with it. And um, yeah, pretty much it. Um, uh, I know with my family, it's, it's a little difficult because there is that language barrier. Um, uh, my father's from Turkey and my mother's from Ecuador. So there, so there will be that kind of issue with trying to get a certain point across to them. So, it, it, you know, there'll be those little moments where I have say with my grandmother and I do a video chat with her in Turkey and, you know, our, our current child, we're trying to do things as non-binary as possible so that, you know, when it comes time, they can choose for themselves who, or at least rat, not choose is not the right word, but reveal themselves, you know, and, and their, in their true identity. And um, one of those things has been, you know, we've never cut their hair since they were born and it's like super long, gorgeous, it's beautiful hair. And, um, and, you know, and, and traditionally that's not seen as, what people you know they're assigned male and, and my grandmother was telling me oh you, you know you should cut their hair you should cut their hair um and <laughs> so she's this 81 year old turkish woman so of course she busts out the mysticism and she comes out with the if you cut his hair he will become tall and strong and I was just like, what? And I'm like, is this anything like when you told my aunt to squirt my newborn eyes with lemon juice to make them shine forever? Like that was a little literal thing that that happened uh, among many other things. But yeah, uh, so so like, you know, combating that at home is, has been difficult with a language barrier, but I've been like doing it in the best way I can by explaining to them like, hey, this doesn't necessarily change how you feel about you know our child does it and they're like well no and i'm like well then why should it matter <laughs> you know so yeah it's, it's a battle i feel like it goes back on the not caring type of mood that you're in because like for me in my house when family members say something that i feel like is like disrespectful in a way i argue with them and i tell them like you know you're wrong for saying that and like we'll have an argument that's fine but like the next day we'll talk and be like, you know, what you said was wrong. And like, it's just, I feel like everybody, family members is different when it comes to that type of conversation. But I feel like people should always fight for that conversation to happen. Yeah, I mean, I was like in my twenties before I ever felt any kind of way about, or like in a good way about like demonstrating emotional vulnerability to my father, right? That's a long time to go without having that kind of relationship and like, that's something that we're still working on, you know, a while, a while later from like when that first began. And so to have that kind of like initial dislocating experience where like I just kind of like broke down and cried in front of him, you know, was not a thing I knew how necessary that was to happen. Right. But that opened something up in order to kind of rebuild or like reform what that relationship would look like. Um, well, for me, it was definitely avoidance. We didn't have those conversations at all, but there was a whole point of just that toxic masculine, definitely from my grandfather. To this day, I don't really talk to him. Like, I was terrified of dogs, animals, all that. So it was some big pit bulls coming at me. And they, they were just like coming. I'm screaming and going off crying. And he's like, oh, man up, man up. You got to be hard. I'm like five, like <laughs> having dogs chasing me around. So like, understanding like that's his mindset of preparing me and toughing me up and stuff but that didn't help us get closer didn't help us have a conversation it helped me stay away from him <laughs> so that's about it i thank y'all for engaging me in that conversation i don't really i'm just personally curious and i'm just appreciative of you all. Um, we have no other questions in the chat. No one's raising their hand. The Q&A is clear. Um, so I'm just super appreciative of you all. It was an amazing conversation. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for everyone attending and listening in. 
Um, we hope you've gained a lot and learned a lot. Feel free if you want to throw in what you've learned or something that shocked you um, in the chat as you head on out. But thank you so much for your time, everyone. Have a great one.